Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Gracias, gracias. Gracias, muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I love you too, I love you too. Dear Matt and Mercy, thank you for the kind invitation to have me here at CPAC. It is truly an honor to be here just a few days after our presidential and legislative elections. Which, by the way, they pulverized the opposition. They say, they say globalism comes to die at CPAC. I'm here to tell you that in El Salvador, they, it's already dead. But if you want globalism to die here too, you must be willing to unapologetically fight against everything and everyone that stands for it. Fight for your freedoms. Fight for your rights. The next president of the United States must not only win an election, he must have the vision, the will, and the courage to do whatever it takes. And above all, he must be able to identify the underlying forces that will conspire him, that will conspire against him. These dark forces are already taking over your country. You may not see it yet, but it's already happening. You don't see it as clearly because people are designed to see linear changes, not exponential ones. We don't always recognize how fast a problem can multiply and spiral out of control. The problem is much like the metaphor of the boiling frog. Once the water boils, it's already too late. People fail to see these things. It's our nature. Just like the frog, people become complacent and they don't realize how bad things are getting until it's too late. Well, I, well, I know, of course, El Salvador is a lot smaller country, Setting aside the differences, there's a similarity with what is happening here in the United States. We also had many apparently isolated problems in the 60s and the 70s, and we failed to realize as a country the severity of them until it became a civil war. By the time we reacted, it was already too late. We were already boiled like the frog. And it took us 50 years, two wars, 250,000 lives, and a third of our population displaced, and a near miracle to get our country back. As your friend, I want to issue this warning so you don't make the same, the same mistakes we did in the 60s and the 70s. It is not easy to pull yourself back once you're in boiling water. In fact, in fact all the experts said it was impossible. And besides, you don't want to wait 50 years and maybe hope for a miracle to get out of hell. You can still jump before the water boils. Some might say I'm exaggerating, but we can clearly see the signs of a declining society because our own hit rock bottom decades ago. It's like when we see someone getting sick. First, he, it's maybe just stomach ache or a headache or a small fever. But if you don't deal with the disease, it will only get worse. And then it, will, it may be, be too late. Even after our first war, in El Salvador, we failed again to look into the signs of the second civil war that was coming, the gang war. After a million people fled the first war, a lot of them came to live in ghettos here in the United States, where the gangs were formed. When former President Clinton deported a lot of those gang members without telling us they were gang members, they were criminals, they roamed free and recruited young people, thousands of young Salvadorans to join the gangs. At first, they seemed like petty criminals, but they began to change and transform until they became the unscrupulous terrorists that we know today. Most of them even performed satanic rituals, and this has been well documented. The government back then didn't deal with the disease, nor did the next administration, nor did the ones after that. The disease 
that had begun with mild symptoms got worse and worse. It became a cancer that seemed incurable. We are already seeing these symptoms in the United States. Big cities in decline like Baltimore, Portland, New York, just to name a few. Places where crime and drugs have become, have become the daily, daily norm and even accepted and promoted by the government. How many young people have you lost to the streets of Philadelphia or San Francisco to fentanyl? Did we see these apocalyptic sites 15, 10, 5 years ago? Can you imagine how it will be in the next 5, 10? For 15 years, the same thing was happening in El Salvador. In the span of less than a decade, gangs took control of all the country and our society. They evolved into a parallel government, controlling elections and even political parties. Every aspect of the daily life of most people was controlled by the gangs. Murder capital of the world is a tragic title to hold. Getting rid of, what, of that was the bare minimum we had to achieve in order to even start thinking about rebuilding our country. But jumping out of the water when it's already boiling is an almost impossible feat. You are not there yet, and believe me, you don't want to be. We did the unthinkable to cleanse our society. We arrested the terrorists, we, but we have to remove corrupt judges and corrupt attorneys and prosecutors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. These corrupt judges, these corrupt judges and prosecutors were setting the gangs, the gang members free. And it wasn't just the gangs. The corrupt system worked in tandem with the so-called international community, the NGOs, and of course the fake news, just like it happens here in the United States. Un unelected bureaucrats are trying to instate public policy. Who elected them? They don't have a democratic mandate. If they want a seat in the table, they should run for office. <laughs> Let the people vote. It will not be a pretty sight for them if the elections are free and fair. I mean, who elected Soros to dictate public policy and laws? <laughs> Why? Why does he feel entitled to impose his agenda? Let me tell you something. Soros and his cronies hit a brick wall in El Salvador. Thank God, thank God, and all the glory be to him, Salvadorans are now immune to his influence. No one believes his lies anymore over there. We just had... We just had free and fair elections, and we won in a landslide with more than 84% of the vote. <laughs> Let that sink in. More than 84% of the people voted to continue our policies. Our victory is unprecedented in the history and modern democracies in the world. They also gave us a supermajority in Congress, more than that, 54 seats out of 60. Fifty-seven, if we count our allies. That's that's ninety-five percent of Congress. Let that also sink in. The people of El Salvador have woken up, and so can you. The global elites they hate our success and they fear yours. The people's free will to choose their leaders is something they despise because they cannot control that. You have experienced this firsthand here in the United States. The global elites control the mainstream media. They finance campaigns. District attorneys, to mention a few. They abuse their powers. They persecute political opponents. In El Salvador, we don't weaponize our judicial system to persecute our political opponents. A practice that may sound familiar to you, but we don't do that there. And who's the dictator? The global elites, the global elites in the media, they work in conjunction, they run some stories and publish them, same pictures to reinforce their agendas. You're no strangers to that here in the United States. We deal with that in El Salvador too. That is the free press that they talk about. I always criticize the defenders of institutionalism, not because I don't think strong institutions are paramount and necessary for a democracy, but because I find them very hypocritical. They don't seem to have the same standards for themselves as they are trying to impose on others. But there's yet another component that is more dangerous than a simple double standard. Institutions were created to serve the people, 
and not the other way around. Somewhere, somewhere along the way, those people forgot their fundamental purpose, which is more important than the institution itself. When the judicial system was created, it was created out of the necessity to bring justice. But now, it seems that survival and control of the judges, of the AGs, among others, are paramount. And the need to bring justice is merely a little more than an afterthought. Another example, the police was created to bring law and order. Let them seek law and order then. But now some of them are even afraid to do their job because they fear the consequences for doing it. They should be encouraged to fulfill their foundational roles without fear of repercussions that distract them, that distract them from their missions. If the police was created to bring law and order, let them bring law and order. If the judicial system was created to bring justice, let them bring justice. Let them protect their purpose at all costs. Same goes with the press. Let them be free. A democracy needs a free press. But to enjoy that membership, you must adhere to their duty as a reporter. Report the facts. Don't be a puppet of those who finance you or finance the organizations that you work for. Your freedom of speech, your freedom of speech will always be protected. We believe in free speech. All, every, everyone here believes in free speech. Your free speech will always be protected. But don't call yourself a journalist if you're just an activist. Don't. Don't call yourself independent if you depend in open society. Saras NGO for those, those sacred institutions have morphed away from the reason they were created. We should not defend those institutions for the sake of being institutions. Instead, we should defend the principles that created those institutions in the first place. It's troubling to see that this is happening everywhere. Not only in El Salvador, in the United States, it's happening everywhere. It, but even here, in the United States, in the most powerful country in the world, even here, it's happening. America should listen to these words, not because the El Salvador model should be replicated here, but because these specific examples apply to any nation that has lost or is losing its way. Ask yourself why this is happening. Who is supporting it? And whether it's by ignorance or by choice. And fight it. Fight it with all your heart and soul. And be the beacon of hope. And be the beacon of hope that your founding fathers, with all their faults like every human being has, dreamt for your country. <laughs> fight for your freedoms, for your rights. Fight for the original purpose of these institutions and not their mere existence. It's still not too late, it can be done. It is time to erase these new paradigms that have been imposed in the recent years that make no sense. If you just free your minds from those invisible chains, you could do it. This shift is an extremely dangerous trend that undermines these institutions. Effectiveness and their credibility is at stake both home and abroad. This is a warning from a friend. You should adhere to, the, to their foundational principles and purposes and denounce this new institutionalism. Now, you would think that's it, as it wasn't enough, right? But unfortunately, there's more. There are other symptoms that are even more difficult to diagnose. For instance, the financial situation of the United States. When I talk to my conservative friends right here, they always tell me that the problem is high taxes, that they're wrong. Of course, High taxes are extremely high here in the United States. I, I give you that. You're right in that. But th that's not the real problem. The real problem is not the high taxes themselves, but the fact that they are not even really funding the government. Not even those high taxes, higher than a lot of places in the world, not even those taxes are really funding the government. So who's financing the government? Government is financed by treasury bonds, paper. And who buys the treasury bonds? Mostly the Fed. And how does the Fed buy them? 
by printing money. But what backing does the Fed have for that money being printed? The Treasury bonds themselves. So basically, you finance the government by printing money out of thin air. Someone could ask, someone could ask, well, so if the government can print the limited amounts of money out of thin air, why did they collect taxes? I mean, in theory, it would make sense, right? If they can print unlimited amounts of money, why would they need taxes? The answer is simple, but it's very shocking. The real problem is that you pay high taxes only to uphold the illusion that you are funding the government, which you are not. It's shocking, but it's true. The government is funded by money printing, paper backed with paper, a bubble that will inevitably, inevitably burst. The situation is even worse than it seems, because if most Americans and the rest of the world were to become aware of this far, confidence in your currency would be lost. The dollar would fall, and the Western civilization with it. If the next president of the United States doesn't make the necessary policies and structural changes, Sooner or later, that bubble will burst. There's still time. You don't have to make the same mistakes we did in the 60s and the 70s. You can still jump before the water boils. Winning the election isn't enough to solve these problems. They will not simply go away as a consequence of an electoral result. It will take a total re-engineering of the government top to bottom. It will entail making difficult decisions like the ones we made in El Salvador since 2019 and they're already paying off. It will be hard. The system will push back, but you have the right to determine your own fate. <laughs> Salvadorans did the same. The decision for the direction of our nation was ours, and it continues to be ours. We didn't tolerate being told what to do. In doing so, we did the unthinkable against all adversity. We transformed El Salvador from the most dangerous country in the world to the safest in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Thank you. We, we did it by defying the global elites. We told them no more. And that is my message to you. Put up the fight, because it is, in the end, it will be worth it. It has been for us, and you will have your country back. May God bless you. May God bless the people of the United States. May God bless El Salvador and the future of both our nations. Thank you very much.